Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. In honor of Valentine's Day, we thought we would focus on the topic of unrequited love, which was actually also a listener request. And why unrequited love on Valentine's Day? Because we're a little bit morose like that. Uh, We're also going to be talking about a dream today at the end of the episode from a 46-year-old woman. And the dream features transparent swan hatchlings. So if that image intrigues you, stay around for the dream. So um, unrequited love, what can we say about this topic from a Jungian perspective? I know I have a lot, but. Well, well, I thought I might just jump in and toss a little bit of mythology in there because so much about Valentine's Day and Cupid and bows and arrows I mean, that all comes from Greco-Roman mythology. Cupid is the Roman version of Eros, and Eros is a little bit more of a rich figure. So Venus and Ares have a long-standing, very passionate love affair. They produce a number of children. One of the (laughs) children is called Eros, who we associate with romantic love, and we're all familiar with that archetypal image of Eros being a little child. He draws this bow, he lets it fly, and it strikes the, uh, the person in the heart, and then they, they fall in love, often with the next thing that they lay their eyes on, much like mm-hmm. a little baby duck. Um, so there's something about imprinting, <laughs> I think, that's going on there. Uh, and then all kinds of hijinks ensue. So this this theme also shows up in A Midsummer Night's Dream, where yes. the fairies can make people fall in love with everybody inappropriate. Um, but this idea that there is an archetype that activates, that makes people fall in love, uh, that it is something that is not a, a purely human thing. Yes. That, that helps us lean a bit into the, to the Jungian idea of the unconscious and the activation of really deep ancient patterns. Yeah. And so, Joseph, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the Roman version of Eros and, and the mythology around that? Well, I, I don't know that it deviates um, too differently um, in terms of Cupid, but where I think... Um, we can lean into the idea of unrequited love, is that Uh Eros had siblings, which which many people don't learn, you know, in high school mythology, but there was a whole family of little (laughs) godlets that that Venus popped out, you know? And uh, so there was Eros, there was um, Hedilogos, who was the god of sweet talk and flattery, and there was Hymeros, uh, the god of sexual desire, desire, and uh, Pothos, the god of passionate longing, and Hymeos, <laughs> who is the god of the wedding ceremony, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's a story that's interesting to our discussion of unrequited love. So Aphrodite gives birth to Eros. And as a baby, Eros starts to fail. And of course, like all mothers, uh, Mm. Aphrodite is panicky about this. So she goes to the ancient earth goddess Themis. And she she basically says, I don't know what to do. This is terrible. And Themis says, you need to go back to Ares and you need to have another child. You need to have another son. And so Aphrodite does, uh, gets back with Ares, she produces another child, and she calls this child 
Enteros. The name Eros means love. Enteros means love returned. And as mm. soon as Enteros is born, Eros and Enteros begin to play and wrestle. And as they play and wrestle, Eros thrives and comes back to life. In classical art, Eros is often depicted with the wings of a dove, white and feathered. Anteros is often depicted with black butterfly wings to suggest mm. this kind of polarity. Mm. The other darker side of Anteros, or Love Returned, based on just the few fragments classicists have shared with us, is that Anteros was also the god who punished those who did not respect or return love. Mm. So in some of the fragments, while Eros was armed with a bow and arrow that could stimulate love, Anteros had a lead club <laughs> and would hunt down those who had rejected love Oops. and club them. And in one of the stories, he clubs somebody and drives them to their death over the side of a cliff. Wow. So um, it, it speaks but Only both. because they really deserved it. Well, I think that uh, Enteros <laughs> would agree with you greatly. So, I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it goes to that archetype that yeah. love yeah. cannot thrive unless it is responded to. Mm -hmm. And the need for the response can bring forward great wrath. Um, when yeah, the response, yeah, right. When the response is not fulsome, yeah, yeah, of, of that response of uh, I'm going to chase you over a cliff with a lead club, of the fury uh, that can come up if love is not requited. I, I'm also aware that um, the parentage is of Aphrodite or Venus and her Roman name the goddess of beauty, and Ares, the god of war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, how those two things form a, a mixture uh, in these two offspring, that Eros can make you love him, and Anteros can wreak vengeance. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah, and vengeance is is in the picture when we have unrequited love because mm -hmm. it, it can stir feelings of uh, real rage and, uh, you know, desire for revenge. I'm thinking about how the moment that Eros sends his arrow is a kind of a lovely picture of what happens during limerence. And limerence mm -hmm. is this state that psychologists have identified, named, and studied. And it, it really is, uh, you know, there's, it's a kind of biochemically mediated state that we can get into. And it is like we're a little crazy when we're in mm -hmm. limerence. It is delicious, but very much like you were saying, Joseph, in uh, Midsummer Night Dream, when Titania falls in love with Bottom, I think, is if I recall... Yes. And, uh, you know, when it's over, when the, the veil is lifted, she's sort of like, what was I thinking? <laughs> and I think a lot right. of us can the relate to that head. in some, <laughs> right. <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> yes. um, one of the interesting things about limerence that uh, was, is actually pointed out uh, really well by um, Andrew G. Marshall in one of his books is that in that state, and, and I'll, put, I'll link that in our book list, uh, in that state of limerence, the other person doesn't have to do anything to inspire our love or keep it going. When we're in limerence, we're mm -hmm. just delighted even with the image of the person. Maybe, maybe we don't even know the person, but we sort of fall in love from afar. We don't have to, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if the person is good to us, treats us well, is polite. None of that matters. Mm -hmm. Limerence is, is just its own thing where, where we're, we, we just feel um, swelled up with these really divine feelings. 
without there needing to be any yeah. reciprocity. Mm. I, I really like that uh, use of the word divine, that, that something does come over us like Cupid's arrow. And I'm thinking about, you know, is limerence like uh, the first experience of love that we often call a crush? And uh, even a crush on somebody very far afield, like a movie star or a sports star, uh, that you're not going to have any uh, hope or prayer of meeting. But it gives a young person the experience in a very safe way of adoration, Mm -hmm. (laughs) of this is what it feels like to love and to have posters of that person on my dormitory wall or something like that, of that I can safely experience uh, these feelings. Um, But I'm also wondering, are we talking about love as romantic love? Or could it be love among friends or uh, you know, other kinds of relationships? Yeah, I mean, I think there can be unrequited feelings between that are not romantic. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And you can have a crush yeah. that's not romantic too, can't you? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that the Greek philosophers and Nicomachean ethics and Plato, I mean, they were talking about the virtue of love and some of the greatest goodnesses and virtues. And Mm. this idea of uh, filial love, this love of one's fellow, the love of Mm. friendship, and, and often defining it as being aligned with the greatest good for the greatest number of people, or at least the greatest good for the friend. And to have that with a Mm -hmm. a full heart, to want what is the greatest good for, Mm -hmm. for the friend, is very much a kind of love. And you're right that one can hold that for a friend and discover that goodwill is not being returned. That the other does not wish us the greatest good. And, and what do we do, as you were saying, Deb, in, in that current of energy? But, you know, it, it, the greatest good is an interesting idea, but I, I also think that something that I can, would call a mm-hmm. crush, it would have this kind of quality of energy to it where there's a little bit of an idealization where it has a little bit of magic or pixie dust about it. You know, the, uh, so whether it's a wh- whether it's a kind of um, more of an erotic crush or even a friendship crush, it 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 it, it there's something there. Well, and okay, so what is the pixie dust, which is maybe where we need to go next? Mm-hmm. Jung would say it's projection, right? So when we fall in love with somebody, when the arrow of Eris lands for us. Part of what's undoubtedly happening is we are projecting part of our own soul onto that other person. And uh, it's, it's some potential that's unlived in us. It, it, it's, uh, it's a little piece of the self so that it has that divine flavor. There's a kind of spiritual yearning that happens, I think, in an intense crush or an in, you know, intense unrequited love. And, and so it, it is an invitation to the depths. It is a real um, mm-hmm. uh, significant experience, even though it's often not what we first think it is. We first think it's about the other person, but really we're being introduced to ourselves. You know, Von I think Franz about, talks the, about this. Yeah. Go ahead, Joseph. Von Franz talks about this, and and she makes that differentiation between the friend and the lover, that the friend attracts often the golden shadow. So, for instance, we have a friend who's a really wonderful dancer, but we're not, or a friend who's an extraordinary writer, but we're not. And it's that admiration around, around the gold that perhaps might activate inside of us, 
but our friend just has it in spades, which which mm-hmm. makes them so appealing. And as you were saying, Lisa, um, it, it is connected to our own, what I would say, undeveloped good qualities, which also means that we can both deeply admire, but also be somewhat jealous of a friend. And that can create a passion. I mean, a very real passion between us. And I would say that mm-hmm. the romantic part is the projection of the anima animus, which is, mm-hmm. which is yet another projection, but it promises a depth of completion that is uh, more fulsome more spiritual, and in some ways more mm-hmm. exotic than the completion that's offered by Golden Shadow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, any I, of that I really hear. can be so painful. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking about how it comes up in us. You know, it's not something we've decided. It isn't something we control. We, that the friend is... No, there's a different attraction. It's not. It doesn't go as deep in the in the psyche because it's shadow, which is related to personal experience. It's uh, contents that can be made conscious. You know, if the friend is somebody who's a great dancer, that friend might say, "Hey, let's go out." You know, I'll you know I'll kind of teach you to dance, and we'll go out, and um, this is something that's attainable. But I think, uh, you know, this kind of love that may be unrequited comes over us. Mm-hmm. It's not something we have desired or control. It is all of a sudden that potential just arises in us for an adoration of whoever the love object is, even if the love object is a a sports star or a film star or uh, something like that, Mm -hmm. that we don't control it. And uh, it's the yearning for, you know, my question is always, what are the qualities? Why that person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What what is it about him or her uh, rather than somebody else, especially if it's somebody like a film star? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, uh, why uh, John Wayne? Why Sean Connery? Why Brad Pitt? Why Bruce Willis? What, what are all I, those I noticed your cheeks flushed types. when you said Brad Pitt. Uh, I want to hear more about you and Brad Pitt, Dad. <laughs> no. Because uh, I can feel my, there's something going on with you yeah, and Brad. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I, have, I have a secret place in me for James Stewart. Oh. And all those roles that he played. The, the the guy that's really sweet, but is a manly man, but doesn't have to strut his stuff. Um, and so we're not well, going to little... draw any conclusions about your choice of husband and last name from that, no. are we? <laughs> exactly. That's right. Some pillow talk with you and Jimmy Stewart, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've always wondered a little bit. And then there's a bad boy or two. But it's interesting. It's interesting to sit back and say, what is it really? Because, as you're saying, Lisa, it's projection. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's but, not a usually a real relationship because it it's it is unrequited. Mm-hmm. So it it's somebody who maybe is far afield, or you know the big man on campus, or the captain of the football team, or the cheerleading squad, or, or uh, just the. The quirky guy in, you know, organic chemistry that, you know, you just That's like right. the way his yes. hair falls in front of his eyes. I mean, it doesn't have to be a person of big status. It could just be someone who it, yes. touches you for some reason. But it's somebody who's maybe a little unattainable. Mm-hmm. Of how, I mean, do I, how, how do I make a connection with the nerdy guy in my organic chemistry class? Just a quick reminder, as I usually do, listeners, that it would be great if you could like us and subscribe on whatever platform you listen to us on, leave a review. These things really help the podcast. If you'd like to sign up to get bonus content every week, you can become a patron. Just go to our website, 
uh, thisunionlife.com. Click on podcast and you'll find a link to our Patreon page there. And as well, consider signing up for Dream School. Dream School is our 12-month online uh, platform where we teach you how to work with your dreams. And finally, just to plug that my book, The Vital Spark, is now out. It has been published, and I'd love it if you would check it out. If you've liked it, leave a review. Those things are very helpful to authors. So thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe there are two different types of unrequited love, or maybe not. I'll, I'll, let me put this out there and see what you guys think. There's the, the crush or the limerence, or you maybe know someone a little bit, or you just met them, and you have these big feelings that you can't stop thinking about them, and you can't mm. fall asleep because your mind is, you know, ranging over that person, and, and nothing ever gets going because it's unrequited, it's unanswered. And then there's, you know, you have a relationship and maybe you feel really strong feelings for the person, but after six or 12 months, they're like, you know, I'm not so into this. And then there's, that's heart, <laughs> that's more heartbreak, you know? So I think we're really focusing more uh, on, on that initial experience of, of having enormous feelings for someone on the basis of um, an initial acquaintance, perhaps that then never, never gets answered. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. I feel like most of us have had that experience at some time in our life. And we're, we're talking about it, as, you know, when it happens with young people. And, and certainly many young people have that experience and it can be a kind of initiation. But it can happen when we're older too. It can happen throughout our life that we develop strong love feelings for someone. And although we're saying, well, it's projection and you should ask yourself, what about the person which I completely agree with? The truth <laughs> is that when you're in the throes of that experience, it doesn't, it doesn't really help to have an intellectual understanding about what might be going on. It has mm -hmm. to be suffered. The other and, thing I want to say is, is that... Very big feelings. Yes, just because something is a projection doesn't mean that it isn't valid. That, right. That the device of the psyche that leads us forward through the entire lifespan through projection is intelligent. That the psyche, which is the deep soulful part of you, is scanning the environment and it's going, we need you to move over here, you know, stage left. And so we're going to spray a little glitter over in stage left <laughs> to get your attention uh -huh. to move over That's there great. because something deeper inside of us is saying, come on, yes. come on, you know? Yeah. And you're right. Just making it an intellectual thing, just getting a telegram saying, please move stage left towards so-and-so, <laughs> that's not going to motivate us. But if you throw some, some fairy dust on it, you throw some glitter on it, then all of a sudden we're moving in that direction. And we could yeah. say that that is a path. It's, it's a path towards recognizing something. So the Freudian thought of projection as something that actually interferes with relationship and it interferes with the achievement of work and love. But Jung and other Jungians came to feel later on in the development of the theory that it is a method that the psyche uses to forward us towards individuation. And following what we love, even if it leads mm -hmm. to a disenchantment at a certain point, still changed us in a way yeah. that something deeper and bigger than the ego decided that we need it. Which yeah, brings us back beautiful. to the idea of the archetypal activation. Yes. Yes. And it's maybe a, an early way since uh, unrequited love is more prevalent among young people uh, than among older people of of getting us in touch with the inner other, uh, the inner anima or animus that we feel these feelings uh, because they're activated by that other person out there. Uh, and later on, we can start to integrate them, that those are all parts of us, of what is undeveloped in me 
that I see or think I see in another person. And that hopefully, uh, in time, can process, make conscious, integrate, and say, ah, you know, to use your earlier example, if I too can learn to dance, I can get out on a dance floor, learn the steps, feel uninhibited, feel, you know, really uh, alive and uh, all those other feelings that my friend, the great dancer, exhibits. So if there's a way that all these things are a call to develop those qualities in ourselves. I love what you this said, pressure. Joseph, that this is intelligent. Mm. Right. That there, there is a telos behind it. And yeah. even if you fall in love with someone tremendously inappropriate, someone who's never going to give you the time of day, there's, some, there's something there. And you don't know what it is. And you can't think your way through it. You know, no. there's a really wonderful book, and I will put it in the book list, written by a Jungian analyst and uh, one of our teachers, Jan Bauer, called Impossible Love. Why the Heart Must Go Wrong. And it's so lovely because uh, what Jan does is she takes the letters of Abelard and Eloise. And, uh, you know, Abelard and Eloise were lovers. Uh, she was his young student. He was a kind of famous mm-hmm. intellectual of the age in the Middle Ages. And uh, they are, you know, it's so illicit that they're together that when they're discovered, I believe that Abelard was castrated, if I have that right. And Eloise was sent to a nunnery where she eventually became a very kind of prominent uh, leader of, of the convent. But she continued to write letters to Abelard. And they wrote letters back and forth, but her letters are really full of heart. You know, so this yearning, this longing for what, what can't be, and the, the, the soul that is wrapped up in that. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a very romantic thing, obviously, to focus on this. But when we can hold it psychologically, we understand the great value. The danger, on the other hand, is that an unrequited love keeps us out of life. Yes. Mm. Yes, that when you really can't let go, you know, when does it become kind of a fixation or even an obsession? Yeah. Uh, And, you know, at some point, uh, we want to have love returned. It's if you stay in that place of forever longing after the impossible other, you are out of life. And you're not available for requited love. And I think sometimes that can happen to people that, you know, that glitter you were talking about, Joseph, gets sprinkled on the stage. And that's what turns me on. And that's what I find so exciting. And that it's my fantasy and my imagination about the impossible other, whereas to settle for an ordinary other uh, where we have to study, uh, I have to go to the laundromat, uh, you have to go to class, um, we have to change the flat tire on somebody's car, doesn't have much glitter. And somewhere we have to sacrifice our projections and fantasies and a certain kind of safety for real world love with an ordinary other. What I would Someone offer who's is, actually available. Mm-hmm, is that there's a difference archetypally between love and relationship. And that's why in the ancient world there were different gods. That Hera, for instance, is the god of marriage. Mm-hmm. Who, who is the goddess of these very intricate relationships between mm. spouses and parents and children and parents and the larger communities and the hierarchy of, of an entire society. Hera was the mistress, the goddess who understood balancing 
these incredible um, social contracts, which which has enormous value. And as I've, and as you've said, Deb, in other podcasts, that Hera's temples were often the largest, most dynamically active and funded temples in some of the ancient cities, which mm. is which is not necessarily associated with Eros. And in mythology, yeah. when, the, for instance, Zeus was struck by love or, or sexuality and she, he's running after somebody, I mean, Hera would murder the people that he was <laughs> love-struck by or kill an yeah. uh, illegitimate offspring. So there's a very different but incredibly important paradigm of relationship, which is different than, I think, this idea of simply the magnetic attraction of love, mm -hmm. which, which may not lead to relationship, which goes very much to what we've been saying in terms of yeah. unrequited love. You know, Eros or Cupid um, plunks you in the heart, sprinkles stardust on that person in the office who is, you know, over there at 10 desks away. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, it's that moment in Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, you know, where the prince is standing there on the floor of the uh, ballroom and he looks up and he uh, sees Cinderella and then he bursts into songs and it's a uh, 10 minutes ago I saw you. I looked up when you came through the door. My head started reeling. You gave me the feeling. The room had no ceiling or floor. And it's not like I've ever had that experience myself that was purely just acting. Oh. <laughs> Never have I felt like that. So I, I'm not sure where that, um, the, that terrible singing effort came from, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I thought. <laughs> yeah, but but it was zesty, and I was feeling it in the moment. So there's that, and of course, in the fairy tale, it's always, and they lived happily ever after. Right. But of course, like all the fabulous satirical yeah. um, things that have been written about what happily after after really looks like, which it, which is relationship which is the hard work mm -hmm. of relationship. It, and that, uh, I wonder about how do we get over or past or through uh, unrequited love of whatever that's about and move into relationship. Because if we stay in that place, uh, you know, the long-suffering uh, person who works for somebody who secretly harbors a love and, uh, you know, stays there, never declares the love, uh, it, it's going to keep that person out of the possibility of a real relationship. A and I, I, uh, love should be requited. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to read something about the ghostly lover from Linda Leonard's book, On the Way to the Wedding, mm -hmm. which if you've been a long-time listener to the podcast, you know how important this book is to me. <laughs> and I'll put it in the, our book list. Um, but, I, but I want to address this issue that you, you're, you're emphasizing here, Deb. Let me, let me start with this. She says, the ghostly lover can be a powerful obstacle on the way to the wedding. This idealized image of an imaginary lover with its haunting hints of the divine, has a fascination which can make mere mortal lovers seem dull and ordinary. The ghostly lover is a figure in the psyche, a part of the psychic reality of all men and women, the one who promises us divinity, an experience of infinity, of magical union with the sublime. Mm -hmm. As such, the ghostly lover can lead us toward our inner creativity and spirituality and bless our outer wedding relationships. But until this figure can be understood and experienced as part of ourselves, it can keep us in the realm of impossible possibility. So it is a both and because there is a value to this experience. And, and I will say, I will say that I have had some very profound unrequited love experiences throughout my life. And they've, they've deepened me 
And there was no way that I could say, come on, Lisa, you know, get over it. I had to just live that experience to the fullest. And, and like I said before, to suffer it. And there was suffering. Mm. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was quite painful. And, and yet it was also transformative. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to, you don't want to take the pixie dust off too soon. However, on the other yeah. side, I have also worked with people who were stuck in longing for that which could not be, who found it difficult to move forward in life in a number of ways. So it is, it is once again, as so many things in the psyche, a question of the both and, of holding the tension, of letting psyche lead, I think, rather than intellect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps being able to do the grieving of letting go of that which cannot be. Uh, that what do we do when we can't have the thing we really, truly, truly desire? Um, how do we move through this? And, and I agree with you, Lisa, that it's a both and that the love experience puts us in touch with parts of ourselves that we can't experience any other way. That's right. A and it's glorious and it's beautiful and it's painful and it's a whole host of things. And th I think the hope is that we will move through it and move toward something that we can have. I have a, a, had a mentor, a very wise woman, a real minimalist, and she would say, want what you can have. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, you know, m but, maybe but Dad, I longing, want... Longing is divine. It, it is divine, and then we have to come back down mm -hmm. to earth. Yeah. I remember, you know, I, um, yeah, in, in high school, my senior year of high school, we had to read King Lear, and our teacher was Mrs. Marshall, and she was uh, great. And um, <laughs> so she said, well, what did you think? And I raised my hand, and I said, you know, it just didn't, it just didn't hold water for me. I mean, this was so ridiculous that he was going to divide up his kingdom, you know, according to whichever daughter was flattering him the most at the time. Like, I just didn't, I could, it just didn't. It just didn't seem real to me. I just couldn't believe yes. that anyone would be that foolish. And a couple other people kind of echoed the sentiment. <laughs> and, then, and then Mrs. Marshall looked over her glasses at us and she said, you've never been in love, have you? <laughs> and I, it, it, the, the story made no sense to me. And, in, and it was such an yeah. interesting response that she had because, you know, King Lear, mm -hmm. it's not a love story, King Lear. It's not actually about love. But it is about something, it is about being shaken to your core and doing something that doesn't make sense. Well, wouldn't you know it, some months later, I, I had my first unrequited love experience. I fell in love for the first time. And, and, and you know what I did in the throes of my suffering? I reread what, King what? Lear. <laughs> and oh it made more gosh. sense. Yeah. So yeah. Um, thank you, Mrs. Marshall. <laughs> that, but that, that is such a great illustration that we have to live these things. We have mm -hmm. to feel those feelings because it goes way below whatever our That's frontal right. cortex can think its way through. That's right. And it's like you had that experience of, oh, now, now I get it. Yeah. Now I understand what it's like to be gripped by something. Mm hmm that completely bypasses sensibility and reason and common sense. Mm -hmm. now, I, now I get it. Mm -hmm. So when we have this energy is released in us, which is archetypal, it's transpersonal, it can then activate so many different things. As we were saying, it can trap us and imprison us, which goes to the myth of Tantalus, who was punished by the mm -hmm. gods to be trapped without food or water 
with like this group of grapes right above the head and constantly up yearning and yearning and yearning, tantalized by the thing that can never be given. So sometimes we can be trapped like yeah. Tantalus in the wanting yes. of something. Sometimes yeah. the longing can then be sublimated and, mm -hmm. and then it becomes a way of life. I, I'm going to quickly read a poem that I love and I've read before. Mm -hmm. It's called Love Dogs by Rumi, no, and it's translated perfect. by Coleman Barks, oh, which is a sublimation, perfect. right? So here's okay, the Okay, go for it. One night a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising, until a cynic said, So, I've heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer for that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Kadir, the guide of souls, in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. So there are times when <laughs> it's like learning how to long, yes, mm -hmm. learning how to long can be directed mm -hmm. in, in any number of different ways. And in this transcendental fashion, in this sublimation to a higher place, it can harness a life of a creative yearning. But I yes. take the meaning that if it stays horizontal and it mm -hmm. doesn't become vertical, mm -hmm. that then it can trap us in, in the tantalus horror. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes our longing our love, our adoration does spark a response in the object of our love. And there can be a kindling in the other person who may not have noticed us or perhaps knew us for 25 years in some other mm -hmm. friendly context. And all of a sudden, this kind of flint and steel pops over across mm -hmm. those, the office, those 10 desks, and the other person <laughs> suddenly feels the heat that yes. is unprecedented. And perhaps with a little bit of tinder and a little bit of fanning the flames, a response, mm -hmm. an enteros awakening, which is an archetype, might occur in the other person. And then the wrestling of the love might create a strength in both parties. Maybe. So mm -hmm. are you, you saying there's hope for me and Ryan Gosling yet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I'm going to look at my crystal ball right now and, and I see it. I oh, and I'm sure it. you have one. <laughs> I do. I actually have a turban as well. <laughs> So which I'll wear in one of the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> like Johnny Carson. Yeah. What I'm thinking about, though, is uh, the blessing of being able to experience our own loving. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's an impossible love, not that yours is, Lisa, but whether it's an impossible love or not, that we get in touch with allowing ourselves to long, to yearn, and to yes. give ourselves over to yes. uh, unrestrained love. And, and then, you know, what use do we make of it? You know, do we, are we like Eloise, where we can make a life in a convent? love our fellow uh, community members, write 
beautiful letters to Abelard mm-hmm. uh, and grow from it, or does it become kind of self sabotaging or uh, a martyrdom or just obsessive and fixated? Of how mm-hmm. are we going to use this? Yeah, and that that hopefully it teaches us how to love yeah. and to put that out there uh, in ways that can be fulfilling and, well, and in and the spirit of our own individuation. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I mean, even to love ourselves, right? Because it is an introduction to our own depths. And Joseph, yeah. thank you for bringing that poem in, because in some sense that says, yes. I think, that that captures it that captures unrequited love and and the, the importance of it and deb i love what you said about just letting ourselves sort of experience it fully but but joseph i also want to go back to your your imagery of letting it become vertical and i think that's where a symbolic understanding a jungian understanding is so helpful because we get out of the concrete we can let it reverberate we can let it sing we can let it be symbolic. We mm-hmm. can, you know, read, you, you know, Pushkin's Eugene on Yegan and cry our eyes out. We can think <laughs> of myths and fairy tales in which there's unrequited love and we can feel ourselves part of this grand story and we can let it echo in the cathedral of our psyche, this feeling of longing and really feel it fully and mm-hmm. know that it is putting us in touch both with something that is transpersonal and in the, our own depths, our own kind of instinctual depths, and that it's moving something in us, even though we don't exactly know what it is. And in that way, an unrequited love becomes an encounter with something that results in a defeat for the ego. So we have to say, I, I want something so badly, and I have to accept that I'm not going to get it. But just Mm. like Rumi's poem, that doesn't negate the importance of my wanting it. Mm. And uh, it it can become, you know, part of our individuation process and specifically uh, the relaxing of the ego agenda. You know, it's very painful to be denied something that you so badly want. But you have to say, ego, it's just not to be. What else yeah. is behind this? Can I open to it? I, that openness I, is central. Mm-hmm. I, I like that a lot of how can it be an opening? And that takes me back to what you were saying, Joseph, about the vertical versus the horizontal that if it remains uh, on the horizontal axis, which is interpersonal, human Mm -hmm. to human, then it's easy to get stuck there, whereas the vertical axis is what's between me and me? What's the part that I can open to in myself through this, through the relational fantasy, even if that's uh, what it is? the rejection, the longing, the yearning, how does this open me to me uh, versus I'm still stuck on being able to have my love for this person reciprocated by that person? That's way too small uh, for, for the soul. Yeah. I, I do take your meaning, Deb, that that um, that when we find ourselves in an unreciprocated love for a great amount of time, not that we mm-hmm. shouldn't still welcome all of the great colorful moments that the psyche gives us, mm-hmm. and we should, but but when we become unwell with longing, and and this can happen, we see this with. Um, Celebrities, when they have somebody who's stalking them, somebody, somebody's adoration 
for a star or a star. Uh, yes. And, and there is limerence and all kinds of fantasy and idealization and so much wanting and perhaps letters and gifts and focus. And, and of course, the, the danger is that all of this need goes towards the object. And star, for instance, may have no idea that person X is focusing all this on them. But the frustration of the unmet need can create a kind of boomerang effect where all of that libido then swings back into the individual. It merges with a kind of infantile aggression, and then it comes, mm. whiplashes back up, and it becomes vengeance. Mm. And then we see the dark side of Enteros, where people feel a desire to hurt someone for arousing them and not satisfying them. This is very, this is mm. a very tricky area. It happens um, in these terrible ways with stalking of celebrities, but it can also happen in a very subtle way in the office and even in the culture where you can hear this resentful bell ringing with people who are profoundly frustrated and unable to get their needs met. So whether they're walking down the street and they see all these beautiful potential connections that are denied to them, and then it becomes mm -hmm. a story of why are these people making me want them mm -hmm. and not ever allowing me to have that first date, to have that union, and the person can become dangerously enraged or chronically hostile or resentful. Mm. They can become, uh, they can retreat into a kind of a hermiting, um, festering place. Well, I'm not going to give life anything because life isn't giving me anything back, it can, it can activate these strange reservoirs in the shadow that um, can hurt the individual and inspire them to hurt other people, for that matter. There is absolutely a very dark place where unrequited desire can have a boomerang effect. It can wind up festering in a lot of strange and sometimes even dangerous places. But for the most part, I think we've been able to establish that this divine ache that seems to be archetypally activated at the level of Eros, mm. that if we can welcome that as a psycho-spiritual experience, if we can believe that some kind of stardust has been thrown in a direction mm -hmm. that is intelligent, that is capable of waking something us in uh, something up in us, just by virtue of acknowledging it and enjoying it and taking the ride even into the fantastical place of what if. And yes, we may be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we won't be trapped like Tantalus. But at the end of the day, we, we will know something more about the depths of our own passions. And there may come some future time where access to that vitality will be incredibly important. And so with that hope, mm -hmm. maybe it's time to transition into a dream. Okay, okay. that's a beautiful way to sum up. So today's dream comes from a 46-year-old woman who uh, works in the environmental field, and she named it Transparent Swan Hatchlings and Bloody Nose. And here's the dream. I'm at the beach with my two sons and a friend of my older son. 
We are staying in a hotel connected to the beach by a trail. We are walking back from the ocean along a raised compacted sand path through wetlands. There are low fences on each side of the path. My dad is walking ahead of us and tells us to check something out, pointing to the wetland to our right. He says there is a whale and some bluebirds. We look and see some bluebirds hopping around in the grass. We also see a nest of swans. There are several swans just emerging out of their eggs. There are broken eggshells and slimy, transparent baby swans moving and (laughs) stretching. They're so clear we can almost see right through them. My older son wants to see them better and gets closer. He walks over the fence and right into the nest. He steps on one of the baby swans, and I think he may have killed it. It turns out he was stepping on a transparent, slimy fish that is also in the nest, a large, transparent koi. He steps on it, but it is only on the edge of its tail, and the fish is not harmed. But I am really mad. I tell him it is not okay. He shrugs it off, acting like it is not a big deal. I start to yell, telling him it is a big deal, that it is illegal, and that he could get arrested for trampling on wildlife so carelessly. Other people are around and hear my yelling. They are starting to stare. My son is getting upset and embarrassed, but he still shows no sign of regret. He tells me to stop yelling. I get so mad, I punch him in the nose. Snot and blood run down his face. The tension is released and my anger subsides and is replaced with shock and regret that I punched him. And she notes, my work is environmental and I realized just recently how much earth grief I am holding in, repressing. I am actively working to hold this grief and forgiveness for all we have done to Mother Earth in my heart, to feel the grief. This dream made me realize how much anger is mixed in with this grief and how this anger is not helping me and is only leading to destructive, violent thoughts or behaviors. The main feelings in the dream were awe and wonder as she saw the swan hatchlings and then overwhelming anger at her son, then shock and regret for her violent behavior. She says, My two sons are the ages they currently are, 12 and 14. My older son is independent, musical, creative, sometimes impulsive, kind, and responsible. My younger son is creative, smart, driven to work the things he loves, sensitive, cares deeply about others, and is a rule follower. I live in the mountains, but the coast shows up frequently in my dreams as a setting. I love water and visiting coastal areas. I am working on a project in a coastal area where we are discussing sea level rise and storm surge and their impact on the landscape. Climate change is undeniable in coastal communities. Well, I'm going to jump right in. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Go for it. (laughs) To me, this is a dream about compensation. And the reason I say that is that when the ego has a particularly one-sided conscious orientation, which let's say is the preciousness of all natural life, the preciousness of wildlife, of nesting areas, that at the moment where that level of intense position constellates, its opposite also constellates somewhere in the unconscious, which is the indifferent, cavalier, childlike, awkward, and clumsy relationship to those exact same values. So what we see in the dream is this confluence of the opposites. That is, the dream ego is full of wonder and protective, um, even rage, about the sanctity of nature, that there is also, you know, an unconscious teenage figure inside of her that is just out of curiosity, trampling, walking in, manhandling, Mm. sticking fingers in things, moving them around, maybe accidentally crushing, you know, a baby swan. Um, with a kind of um, perhaps naive, enthusiastic 
clumsiness, and that both of those qualities are inside of her, and that right now it's very difficult for her to embrace that young, unskilled, clumsy part of herself, that she wants to subdue it, punch it in the nose, Mm -hmm. be aggressive towards her own unskilled handling. And the good news is that the two parts of her meet in the dream. Yes, the dream ego acts out, but there is the beginning of a reconciliation in as much as she realizes that she is mistreating some part of her own psyche that requires a very different response, and that dominating rage is not adequate for her to understand that she is both the protector of the natural environment and also equally as clumsy and injurious as the average person marauding through the natural world. Mm-hmm. And now I shall step aside <laughs> after <laughs> having put all, put all that out with so much confidence. Yeah. So. No, that you know, there's something, there's something there. I'm, there's something I, I'm reaching for that I'm not going to. I don't think I'm going to be able to get my hands all the way around it. But, but um, the sun does not injure. First of all, in the end, nothing. Maybe it's just slightly injured, but he doesn't. He doesn't wind up killing anything. And as you point out, Joseph, it's not done in any uh, out of any malice. It's actually done in mm-hmm. a kind of enthusiastic uh, enjoyment of this phenomenon. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember there was this book that I read a number of years ago called The Last Child in the Woods. And it was talking about children's relationship with nature. And we teach kids to be very careful. And we say, don't touch, don't touch, don't touch. But, you know, it, it used some of some of the greatest uh, naturalists, actually, as children did things like hunt, you know, and it's just sort of like being out in, in the in nature. I'm, I'm not I'm not sort of proposing here that. Uh, you know, hunting is the the answer to our ecological crisis. But I think I'm going to something along the lines of what you were talking about, which is that there's something very precious here. It's fenced off. It can only be enjoyed from this narrow path. And if we think about that, even taking it out of the context of the environment and just say, what about our relationship to instinctual life in general, mm-hmm. our own instinctual life, where is that so fenced off that it can only be enjoyed from a distance? And uh, could we imagine that the spirit of this 14-year-old, let me take a closer look, that that's actually the medicinal attitude that one would want to take, mm-hmm. uh, that the ego might, there's, a, there's a, some kind of rigidity I'm sensing in, in the ego. I also want to say, mm. just throwing this out there, we, we don't know a lot about, you know, who her sons are and what their relationship is like right now. This is one of those dreams where if I had the dreamer here, I would explore whether there might be an objective uh, uh, real, uh, aspect to this dream. Is it saying something about her actual relationship with her actual son is there's something about the dynamic between them in the dream that is commenting Mm -hmm. on an on a real life waking dynamic as well and i just don't know because i don't have enough information Mm -hmm. sure you know what i um noted at the beginning of the dream is that we have the dream ego who is a woman her two sons a friend of one of her sons, and her dad. So there are actually five people here, uh, four of whom, I assume the friend of the son is another boy, but um, I think that's a reasonable, uh, at least a path to go down here. And um, what might be playing out, we call nature Mother Nature, uh, and there's a nest of hatchlings. There's a lot of this new birth, tenderness, mothering, nurturing, uh, as opposed to what the dream ego sees as this recklessness uh, by, by the 14-year-old. Uh, he's just curious. 
So he he just pops himself over the fence um, and, and isn't especially attentive. And I'm thinking you're, I think you've gotten to it, Joseph, with the idea of the compensatory function of the psyche. And Jung says that that is uh, the key component in every dream, that something about the dream, uh, like balancing a seesaw, uh, will take something that is too much in one direction and present the other. And uh, that maybe there is something in this male energy, the three boys and a father, uh, that that it also serves a purpose. Uh, it turns out it's not a baby swan. Uh, it's a fish. The fish isn't hurt. And I'm also, uh, so no harm was done, but she's mad. She's mad about the attitude. The other thing that I have to say has gripped me is that she lives in the mountains and does coastal work. So there's uh, those two opposites of living up high uh, and working down where the water is. Uh, you know, the great mother, the great unconscious. So I think we're all walking around a series of opposites here that the dream presents. Uh, and that at the end, she feels bad about having been herself attacking, which is what she accuses her son of doing. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. her son, you know, uh, so it sort of comes full circle. I'm curious about what the dad is doing there. I'm sorry we don't have any associations to him. That would be interesting. Mm -mm. And, you know, you're right, Deb. I mean, the son, what the son does is transgressive. And, the, and yes. that which is trick. In order to individuate, we usually have to transgress. I'm also really curious about the whale in the wetlands. And I'm noticing, mm -hmm. which of course is an entirely inappropriate place for a whale, and I'm, and I'm noticing that there seems to be an, an echoing of that theme with the fish in the nest, which presumably is still alive because she's worried about it being injured. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, you know, there are these, there are these new contents, the, 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 what do they call baby swans? Cygnets? Is that what they call them? Uh, these yes, little yes. baby swans <laughs> and the fish, that they're uh, transparent. Mm -hmm. They're so... Uh, they're so vulnerable Fra fragile. and fragile, yeah. but it's this kind of new and a little bit gross, you know, it's kind of slimy and bloody, both of them, uh, or at least slimy and, uh, it's a little gross, but it's, it's miraculous and it's, and it's life. And, and the sun just kind of instinctively moves toward it. Um, so, so yeah, but that somehow there's a whale in the wrong place. A whale does not. And a fish in the wrong place. place. And a fish in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. and, and both of them are, you know, perhaps constrained, you know, like a whale in the wetlands wouldn't be able to swim. And a fish in a nest wouldn't be able to swim either. And, and this boy is trying to break out of the constraints. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that, there's a theme there. I don't know. I mean, I think it's there are so many. The... Yeah, go ahead, Deb. I'm just going to the uh, last part of the dream of all these feelings that come up. Uh, that um, she says, "I am really mad." The the tape fish is not harmed. She's mad. She tells her son it's not okay. He shrugs it off, so he's disdainful. Then she starts yelling at him. Then she's embarrassed be because other people are nearby and hear her yelling. They start to stare. Her son gets upset and embarrassed. Uh, she gets so mad she punches him in the nose, and then the tension is released. 
Mm-hmm. And my anger subsides and is replaced with shock and regret that I punched him. I am still puzzling over all these feelings of the, the tenderness of our dream ego toward the wetlands and bluebirds and the whale and the little swans and everything is very, very precious. Uh, it juxtaposed with um, the anger toward her I'm son. Knock you in the and, nose. Uh, and it goes to the interpersonal realm instead of the natural realm. And that it's maybe somehow the dream ego is loving nature in its tenderness and uh, uh, all these wonderful images of whales and so on. But when it comes to an interpersonal relationship, that doesn't feel the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's where this anger and embarrassment and regret and I, I'm not quite sure where I'm landing with this. Maybe you guys can help me, but I, it, it's yeah. two very opposite sets of feelings. Yes. I I also think it's it's um it's an interesting task to hold a dream like this because I hear the dreamers great sorrow for mm-hmm. uh, what we're doing to the planet. And, and it's, it's hard to know. Um, like where that is in the dream. And I think maybe to your point, Deb, although I, I very much, you know, agree with this dreamer that, that there's this, unbelievably tragic thing that we're just doing to the planet every day. I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's too big to take in. Uh, Way too big. I wonder if there's something about being with that sadness that uh, the, the shadow side of being so aware of that is something like a power drive or self-righteousness or something. Mm-hmm. And maybe that goes to your your point, Deb, about the um, you know, this kind of very unlikely feeling that arises that she's going to punch her kid in the nose. It must be hard, yeah, to work. You know, I I find that yeah. really moving. How you devote your life, your professional life education uh, to a love for the planet, for nature, uh, and it is unrequited, which is what we just finished talking about, Mm. that environmental damage continues. Um, There are, you know, all the things we all know about from flooding to fires. and. I wonder if it is really hard to hold going to work every day. Yeah. Uh, to preserve, to do your small part of preserving a natural balance, and have have the feeling that despite all that she and others do, uh, that it feels like the sun who just shrugs it off and acts like it's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. You're right about that, Deb. Yeah. Putting all of this on a kind of inner theater in my mind, mm-hmm. and just and just wondering, you know, what's happening between the characters. There is also a, um, the sun represents a certain pleasure in defiance. That I think there is also a, um, a tension in the psyche of the dreamer that has to do with uh, obedience versus disobedience. 
which I think, of course, is played out in the home. You have a teenage child who is individuating from the mother, is getting out of the nest, is not respecting the nest, and (laughs) is dismissing the world of the nest and the world of the mother, which goes a bit to what you were saying, Lisa, about the possibility that this has something to do with just the development of her relationship with her son. Robert Bly gives this interesting story towards the end of Iron John. I think it's in Iron John. It may have been one of his lectures where he's talking about the tension between the mother and the teenage son. And in Mm -hmm. one of these stories that uh, parents had divorced, mom is raising the teenage boy, And they're in the kitchen. She comes in and she just walks behind her son and just puts her arms around him and gives him a hug. And the boy has this explosive, shocking reaction where he kind of throws his arms open and and kind of catapults her back onto her rear end on the floor of the kitchen. And they both turn and look at each other in shock. And the next day, she calls her ex-husband and says, I think it's time for him to move in with you. (laughs) That there also is this archetypal activation where Mm. if the son is not helped to, to leave the world of the mother, that this other kind of energy will start stomping around, both in terms of the son stomping around in the nest because he needs to get out of the nest, but also something about the mama bear, you know, running the cub up the pine tree um, (laughs) with her growls as she walks off and and leaves them to fend for themselves, kind of the bloody nosing, so to speak, of the cub. Yeah, yeah. So part of this is the rupture around the nest that, Mm -hmm. that she might learn something from it. It's like, you know, I think my son probably should be disregarding the rules of the nest right now because that's going to prepare him to leave the nest. Uh Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting, Joseph. Yeah. Mm. There's a very, this is a really complex stream. There are Mm -hmm. so many facets to it. Uh, so many areas of, uh, of relevance, and mm-hmm. we'll have to leave it to our dreamer, and thank you very much for sending the dream, but we leave it to you to parse out what resonates uh, f- for you at this, at this time. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.